So good to see some faces that I saw in the previous talk. <laughs> Can't have been that bad then. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, coming from the same uh, project, uh, we're going to extend on security today. A little bit about myself, if you don't know me yet. Uh, I'm born in London, I work for quite a few companies. Uh, now I live in Berlin, and I'm in the startup scene, as probably everybody in Berlin is. Uh, studied in England, uh, I'm originally a C programmer, that sort of ma moved up the ranks to do, do a lot of project management now. And I try to do some coding, uh, most of the, or I try to do most of my coding actually. And so, anyway, uh, currently I'm working on a new project that's called dbook, which is a, a document creation tool. And uh, so the talk I held today uh, in the morning or the early afternoon was about how we do data management. And another thing we did uh, is security. And um, so security is, uh, if you get it wrong, it's very, very, very expensive. And a lot of things, uh, happen because people don't have a plan. Um, so just the Adobe hack was like 150 million dollars. Uh, I mean, just for a stupid error. Uh, I mean, that's a scale that, that that's unbelievable, actually, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, so what we did is when we started the company, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> but uh, we looked at the web stack, and we sort of th said, how. Uh, how can, what, what rules can we sort of deduct? What rules can we sort of see that we, um, that we can extract and act on them accordingly? Uh, security is always a trade-off. I mean, you will never have the perfect secure system. Never. I mean, uh, I mean, whoops. In the worst case, people will come along and shoot you. And probably after they've shot your kneecaps, you'll tell them any password. Uh, so it's always a trade-off between how secure does it need to be, uh, and how secure can I make it? And of course, you've got the monetary aspect. I mean, if you're working in a company, you can't spend all your day working, or not every company, but uh, you can't spend all your day thinking about security, right? I mean, there are some companies, obviously, that do that, but most companies don't. Most companies let their programmers decide about security, and uh, that is pretty much the worst case again. Um, so, uh, I'm sort of quite convinced that a lot of the errors that come up in normal day-to-day -day life can be uh, resolved through planning, and the same with security. I think if you think about uh, what threats are there towards my software, what do I have which, is, uh, like which needs security, and what level of security does that data need, I think you can mitigate quite a lot of, of these threats. And uh, what, what is valuable for your company? Is it the data? Uh, is it the code? Maybe you're open source, so you don't have to protect the code, right? You can just say this is the code. Maybe it's files, so user uploads. So basically you need a sort of roadmap, what's important for your company, and if this leaks, how threatening it is to your business model. And obviously what to do uh, if it happens. But in this talk, I want to sort of talk about some of the threats we identified at the beginning and how we challenged them and how we sort of tried to, to mitigate them at least. So first of all, physical accesses fail. If somebody has physical access to your machine, it is compromised. Uh, basically, they can do whatever they want with it, they can plug in USB devices, they can plug in keyboard sniffers, they can do whatever they want. It's very, very, if not near to impossible uh, to, to secure a machine uh, if, if intruders or attackers have physical access to the machine. There are some approaches and stuff, but in theory, you could change the main board and change the chip or whatever, right? So um, basically, make sure that your servers are in secure locations. Uh, make sure you know where the servers are, maybe. <laughs> make sure you, uh, who you trust. That's very important. Do you trust that hosting provider, that hosting provider? Maybe just pop by and, and say hello and see if you can get into the server room, which I actually, for an old job, I tried and I actually got physical access to my server but without identification, without anything. And then we changed. <laughs> so um, make sure where you have is secure. And uh, then try to monitor your servers. So they're very easy things just to sort of see if somebody's tempered with your device. I mean, some uh, hosting providers offer like video access that you can sort of see a video stream of your server. If you're handling bank data, that might be or, or very sensitive data. That might be something you want to think about. Maybe get the servers in your own location and think about. But then, obviously, the cleaning lady might have access. Uh, 
which was another hack that the cleaning lady actually hacked the machine. And um, so physical access in, in general is fail. So check out who has access to your machine. So the first real threat is somebody steals your hard drive. And this has happened quite a lot of times. Uh, that somebody just went into a computer center and pulled out a hard drive. And it's astonishing to see how many people don't encrypt their hard drives. I'm astonished uh, how, pe how many people don't encrypt their laptops. I mean, imagine all my company secrets are on my laptop, and it's in my bag, and that it will be stolen. I know that that laptop is going to be gone at some stage in my life. Or my telephone, exactly. Which I know these things are going to vanish, and they have vanished. And in my old office, I just opened the door and took out all laptops. So if, what would have happened if all our data would have been on, uh, all our data was on there, but it was encrypted. But let's say somebody else would have come in there and looked at all our business data, looked at all our customer records, looked at all that. So I'm still really, really astonished if somebody doesn't encrypt his laptop. And I can only tell you, Mac, it's super easy. Linux, it's super easy. Even OpenBSD, it's two clicks, right? So encrypt your hard drives, uh, even on your servers, basically, Performance hits are near to zero. So I did some benchmarking on this, and we had a really, really small performance overhead. But looks on Linux is super easy. And sometimes you get some problems when you have to reboot, when you have to rebuild a RAID array or something. But it's a total trade-off that everybody should take. Right? It's so easy to get, go into a data center, pull out a hard drive out of RAID. The sysadmin won't even know you've lost all your data. You've been compromised, and you don't even know it. Yeah. So, so th this is the, the exactly. So this is a typical trade-off, right? So on some servers, we just encrypt the database partition. So we just say, okay, if the machine reboots, if someone tampers with it, fair enough, uh, because we know so that the location is secure. But I would, I mean, on laptops, surely I would advise to encrypt everything. But uh, on servers, it's a, it's a sort of trade-off thing. How, how, because the problem is, if you encrypt everything, even your boot partition, and you want to reboot, it's very hard to add the password. You have to sort of remote V and C in, and, uh, which we do now. On, on dbook, everything's encrypted. And if a machine reboots, I go through the whole horrible VNC thing, enter this stupid password. So we, we try not to reboot. <laughs> but um, yeah. So it's a trade-off again. You always have to see what data do I want to protect. Uh, so clearly, if you don't encrypt boot, anybody can come in and rewrite boot. But if somebody pulls out your hard drive, he won't be able to see your data. Whereas some people actually encrypt their database partition, but don't encrypt their swap partition, or don't encrypt temp. And you've still got all the data. <laughs> so the second threat, uh, someone gets SSH onto your server. And this is like the, the mega super threat thing, uh, which happens a lot. I mean, if I look at all the SSH bots I get that ping onto my servers, trying all these different passwords, uh, and I'm like, why are these still around? This is something that everybody should be able to really easily mitigate. And so don't have accounts on your servers is a simple thing. Don't have user accounts on your servers. If, of course, if you're hosting, if you're your SSH provider, you should, but. Uh, on a web server, database server, there's no reason why you should have user accounts on that server. Why should XYZ be able to go onto that server? Use configuration management to do that, right? Uh, there's Fabric, there's so many, there's Salt, there's so many configuration management scripts out there. No developer or, or admin actually really needs access to a server anymore, in my opinion. Use certificates is the easiest. Uh, don't have passwords, basically. So. A few years ago, we did a few thousand machines. I think we did 150,000 machines or something. And we had no passwords, right? Everything was, done, everything was done with certificates. Uh, a simple thing is use fail to ban, which I would also recommend. Um, then you can, so if somebody gets SSH as a low user permission sort of thing, you can gain some security for randomizing memory and encrypting swap and stuff like that. Uh, but this is sort of the last resort. I would sort of always randomize memory anyway, because your software, your web server might have some error. So you don't want like a, a noob slide or something happening. Um, only allow SSH from certain IP addresses is probably the most easy thing to do. Just open a VPN tunnel to your network. 
And uh, what was one of the most funny experiences in my life was having a honeypot that would uh, open up once in a while to these SSH pings. Uh, then a friend copied this idea, uh, but he did it on his production machine. And uh, yeah, it went all quite wrong. <laughs> so uh, do, a, do a firewall redirect or something to some honeypot machine. <laughs> But really good. Try it. Just leave something open on a machine you don't need. Uh, just put a password, one, two, three, or something, and then just track what people do. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's and and the problem is they don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> Eighty percent of them are script kiddies. Just sorry. I had a production machine that yeah. was uh, hacked with this, this way. Yeah. Uh, like uh, one hour after the installation and before it was puppetized, yeah. let's say. Before it exactly. was to change everything. And yeah, that. exactly. That's, I mean, and they discovered that like a few weeks after. Yeah, that it's, it's amazing. It's because nobody could believe that. So yeah. They're very good at it. They're, I mean, these scripts are, are extremely well adapted. They, they try all different SSH versions, and they try to figure out which SSH version you have if there's an error in it. Um, so I don't have 20, uh, port 22 open publicly, except if it's a honeypot. So if you try the machines, it's a honeypot. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I did there. Yeah, I had uh, everything. Basically, I had a different SSH port, and everything that would come into 22, I had an IP table rule just redirect. Uh, now we go in through VPN. We have like a closed VPN, especially with IP version six. A lot of these problems go away because you can just say this is my sort of private networky thing, and you don't have yes. Yes, yes, obviously, yeah. I mean, probably don't run it anywhere. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> uh, uh, the Amazon free instances are quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you get a considerable amount of hacking out of those free instances. Amazon does shut you off at some stage, though. Uh, so then we come to the next threat. Somebody uploads dangerous files. And I see a lot of open source Django projects, go to PyPI, and uh, it's sickening how many people don't, don't check stuff. They just do the standard Django upload field, and they accept this as being the perfect security, which is it not. I mean, it's, it's Django upload is literally get a file and save it somewhere. It doesn't check what file it is. It doesn't check what type of file it is. It doesn't check for size. So uh, obviously, you have a different process serving your media and static files to your actual files. Uh, have an Apache or an Nginx or something, basically have it separated. Uh, another thing which is really easy to do is verify uploaded files through Python magic or some other thing. Just do a fingerprint on the first few bytes and check, is it really what I'm expecting? Sorry. So think of maximum file size. This is like a classic, just upload a five gigabyte file and see if the server holds up. Very nice to, to fill up temp, for example, because what happens is it saves everything into temp, first of all. And you just open enough threads, and then temp is full. Uh, another thing, a lot of services offer you to uh, upload files, right? So why not fill up their storage with uploading millions of files? Script it, and that's it. Uh, check file permissions and access. You're going to see, yes? Yes, underscore one or two of things. Exactly, exactly. So I'll show you the script that actually mitigates this in a minute. Uh, check file permission access. You'll see this a lot. And a lot of the code reviews I, I've done or I do, uh, I see this done wrong. I mean, I see people ch modding 777 on their web root and because SQLite needs it. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically this, you'll see this loads, because every, t every time I wrote this slide, I thought, oh yeah, I saw this being done wrong. And every time you'll see this, you'll, you'll know I've got a story to tell. 
Uh, Unicode was a problem, isn't so much anymore. There used to be horrible Unicode things happening uh, that would crash Django and, and do horrible things. Uh, now, it's not so much. Check file names is always a good idea, sort of see if the file already exists, do all this. This becomes very interesting when you have big production environments that are multi-threaded that start writing to different file systems and stuff. Uh, so here's just a really simple thing how to check uh, that test.pdf is really a PDF. Uh, it's as simple as that. And like this you can verify, is the uploaded file really a PDF? Uh, please keep in mind Django really just uploads the whole file and then does all the checks. Uh, so this is a threat you'll have to configure Apache or Nginx or whatever server you're using to stop this. Uh, then this is pretty much it, right? You see if a user, the count is over a thousand, you say F off. Because you know, okay, uh, a file can only be five megabytes, you can calculate when you're break even, when you're going to have a problem and you'd send an email when it fills up so you can stop this. But it's as easy as that to stop uh, end files being uploaded, which a lot of services actually allow you to do. I mean. I know a lot of Django projects where you can just upload as many files as you want and it will just crash the server. Um, exactly then, somebody downloads files, uh, they shouldn't. Uh, this is another, this is probably one of the problems that comes from having your, your upload server being different from your file server, your static file server, your media file server. That not everything a user uploads might be public and just protecting it through the, a view are saying, is the user allowed to see this? It's not enough because obviously you're serving a file served by a different server that's not aware of what it's serving. So this URL can be served out to the whole world and everybody can see that file. Does that make sense? Did that, that was a little bit confusing, but I hope it sort of came through. If you didn't understand it, ask me. Um, so there's this private media package, uh, which is awesome. Uh, it needs a lot of patching, but <laughs> it's still awesome. And what it basically does, it says, okay, I'm going to do all the file serving for you, but I'm going to use uh, Apache X send files to actually then serve the file, which basically just says, it says to Apache serve this file for me, but it does all the checking for you. So you basically write the check routines, and um, like this you can guarantee that the static files or the media files more that user uploaded are actually only seen by the users that should be able to see it. Uh, you lose some performance because obviously the, the media file will first of all go to Django. It will be checked and then Django will hand off to Apache and uh, do it. But this is like, it's like a really thin layer and I did 10,000 requests and I didn't see any change in performance. So um, I assume it's quite low overhead. Um, have a look at it, it's a really cool tool. Uh, Ajax is your enemy as far as it goes with Django. <laughs> a lot of things that Django brings out of the house that are really nice uh, don't work with Ajax anymore. Uh, I've, I've got quite a biased opinion about the Ajax, but um, okay, so if you use Ajax, if you have to use it, be really, really careful. Uh, don't, a lot of things are just not done for you anymore. All this standard Django niceness that will come to at the end is sort of omitted, like escaping doesn't work properly. Uh, you can really see it was an afterthought. It was really sort of thought, ah, we've got this amazing model view thing and it's request and response, ah, we need Ajax. And then they sort of plonked it on top. And, it, and performance is not the best. That's probably the thing that annoys me the most. That's, it seems to be quite slow. And it's very difficult to get it right and secure. I've seen horrible code there and very unsecure code. So if you have to do Ajax, maybe look in some other direction or be really careful. So uh, a threat uh, that I don't think is so big, but uh, we still got it on our threat list, is what happens if there's a security hole in Apache or Nginx. Um, so what we do is we only include models we really, really need. So we're very careful what do we include when we, when we start the service. Uh, we're really, really careful when we configure it. Again, we only use configuration management to configure it. So nobody is allowed to just SSH into the production machine and change something because it's easy, which is the classic. Uh, it has to go through the whole vetting process, which we have when we do the configuration. Uh, and like this, we try to avoid stupid configurations. And keep your packages up to date. I mean, that's probably the most... 
that's why probably you should not use Gen2, but use, uh, I'm going to make a lot of enemies here. <laughs> use, use, a, use something that you pay for is basically what I've had the experience with. Uh, I've had very good experience with Red Hat and stuff. I know that Ubuntu has very good packages and Debian too. They're very fast in fixing packages. Uh, I wouldn't know why you would have production servers that don't update their packages regularly, especially SSH, Apache, hours count here, right? There's a zero day, zero day exploit. You're talking hours to minutes you want to fix this because you're going to be one of the targets. And if you haven't fixed it till then, you're a target. So if you rely on a small Linux distro that's compiled by two people that are sleeping at that time, you're compromised. So uh, if you're really running production grade stuff, dish out the money, get professional support, pay somebody for it, uh, it's worth it. So we had this case, we were running Gentoo, that's why, and they hacked us because of a zero day exploit. And since then we've been running Red Hat and CentOS and it's been amazing. <laughs> uh, someone can read source files, which isn't that unlikely, which happens quite a lot, that people gain access and can read your source files. Uh, probably your source files, and your source code is probably not as big, the pro as big as a problem if you're open source and stuff. A lot of companies rely on their source code as being their business value. That's quite horrible if that leaks. But basically, I've seen in settings files, I've seen passwords, I've seen passwords being 1234, secret keys being 1234. It's not hard to sort of get it into the OS environment and not make it visible right away. Uh, what I saw last week is uh, Git and SSH keys. I saw the private Git or SSH key in the repo because he was too lazy to just sort of have it in his own home folder and so he could do git pull, he had his private key in there. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, someone can write into my source files. Uh, that's of course like really, really bad. Um, but it can be sort of solved by using Tripwire, which is a really simple, easy tool. Works really nicely. Uh, we've never had a problem with it. Uh, some stuff can be done with SE Linux and, and so forth. Git div is astonishingly easy. Uh, just do a git div on your, on your directory and see what has changed. And probably you know the files that have changed anyway. But uh, if someone can write to it, they normally won't check the git div repository. And again, check your permissions. <laughs> again, I've seen break-ins happen because there were bad permissions set. Uh, someone can execute my code. This is probably like uh, another really bad case. Uh, wh which is a really easy uh, case is once some, a user uploads a file and you've written it, just change the permission. So you can't, you can't modify it and you can't execute it. Just set it so you only read only every file that is uploaded by the user. You get rid of a lot of problems like that. And it's one line of Python code. Uh, uh, so then sort of you have to think about where am I saving my data? And so somebody's writing your code, and that's really, really bad. But what, what else can you do? In theory, he can gain access to the database, right? So uh, what we do is we disallow delete on the database. And we go even so far, we say that you're not allowed to update the database. So if somebody can go in, he can still read all the stuff in theory, but he can't modify our data. So you can't inject false data. Uh, have backups, really, uh, I'll come to that in a little bit later, which I cannot stress enough. Uh, and obviously have source files read only. Uh, someone can modify or read your backup. This is like, uh, so, so actually what happened in, in this story is uh, they had this huge server and they backed up on these tape drives. And at night, somebody kicked in the door, took the server, and of course, he took the tape drives, right? I mean, they're there. So they had all this encryption and everything on their machine, but the tape drives weren't. <laughs> so uh, that company actually went bankrupt because of that. They actually uh, had, they, they lost all their business because they had to notify all their customers that they were compromised and all the customers left. Uh, so uh, yeah, as dark as that may sound, Think about your backups. <laughs> uh, use an extra process and a different user. Uh, use write-only storage. 
which is really simple, just like a Dropbox, you push it in there. If somebody compromises your machine, he can't compromise your backup. Uh, obviously, use encrypted storage on your backup and transmit it encrypted. Uh, when I was a student, we would just put a hub in the network and would sniff all the network of the whole network. And in my student house, 10 geeks, we amazing stuff happened. So just seeing what everybody was doing. It's so easy, right? I mean, just get a little hub and plug it in there. And instantly, you see everything. Um, uh, check the certs. So the typical thing is somebody brings up a, a machine in your network, starts a DNS server. You're using some DNS server that takes longer to respond, and suddenly he's a backup machine, right? So because he answers faster than the DNS, Yes, exactly. That basically goes with uh, use encrypted storage and transmission. So, yes. Yes, that's a very, very true. Very true. I forgot that. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Uh, so, basically, encrypt your backup and sign it. Um, check the cert. Uh, so, have a, cert have a cert certificate on your backup server and check that it's really the backup server. Uh, don't just push it to any IP address that you hope is the machine because you can't rely on DNS. DNS is really unsecure. Just start a DNS server in any network and you can take over pretty much anything. Uh, never throw away backups. You never know <laughs> when you were hacked. You never know when you might need it. The cost of keeping a backup is near to nothing nowadays. So why would you throw away something like this? The next threat, somebody can read your traffic. And this is incredibly easy. Use HTTPS. It's known technology. Uh, Get a signed cert. I know it's snake oil. I know it's useless, actually. But people will expect it. And people don't trust your service if you don't have it. And I mean, it doesn't really help if you, can, you can't. I mean, enough certificate authorities have been hacked and new certificates have been issued. But it's, I think it's worth it. But just use HTTPS. Uh, Sniffing the network here is quite astonishing how many people get their email unencrypted. Uh, just doing pop, I'm just saying that's all unencrypted. <laughs> uh, just encrypt. You don't know where your traffic is going over. You just, you don't. I mean, enough people here have got their laptops open, they're browsing websites, and anybody can, and can see it, right? It's an open network. All your email that you get over pop, if it's not encrypted, everybody can read. So use the, these uh, encryption technologies. They're standard, they work. The NSA can crack it, but the NSA will come in and shoot your kneecaps away, right? So we're not talking NSA-grade security here. We're talking the average guy with a laptop sitting in a conference room doing a network sniffing. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> who, who's logged on to? <laughs> I can see it all here. Uh, in Django, there are two very easy configuration setting files or setting parameters to ensure this. Obviously, you don't want your cookies to leak over an unencrypted network, and especially not your session cookie. So, uh, somebody can read your database. Uh, so, there's a classical thing uh, when somebody hacks the machine, he does a select star on the user database and saves that, right? Uh, and then he adds a new user that has admin rights. So, he has admin on the whole system. Those are sort of the normal steps you'll see in any compromising situation. First of all, get all the data you can, all the password hashes. I deliberately didn't go into hash your passwords, do that. If you don't know that, you shouldn't be doing programming, sorry. If you, if you don't hash your passwords, if you keep your passwords in plain text, leave, get a new job. I'm sorry, you've lost it. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. If somebody saves clean text passwords, just, I don't know, build, don't, no, just go. <laughs> I have no advice for you. <laughs> Uh, so what we do now is we do these really interesting PostgreSQL stuff with table update and stuff. It's not very scalable and not very nice. And uh, so we do these other things that we override the delete method and stuff. So if somebody can execute stuff, we say you're not allowed to delete. And we override the base item manager, the models manager. To do like filter, we do some checks in there. But obviously in a compromising situation, um, that doesn't really help because somebody can just uncomment those functions. And I'm sort of relying, if somebody can edit the code, you can't restart the server. So we've sort of got some security there, but. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. So we do it in the model now, which is probably the worst idea thinking about it. But, uh, but anyway, we just don't allow it in the database. So this is just sort of backup for security reasons. But so uh, I've been working on something <laughs> uh, which is not finished yet, which I hope I'll, I'll finish at some stage. And I'd love your input on this. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, yes. Post SQL. That's what we do. That's what we do. So uh, you have this. Basically, you have this uh, post SQL okay. uh, permission. So this function is just uh, we add it to make the life harder, and for bad programmers to get <laughs> a bad response, uh, because someone actually someone was coding and he's like, oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And, uh, so we added this. <laughs> yeah. But exactly. So, so the problem you have there, if somebody's managed to get into your Python executable, uh, he can override all that because what he can do, he can just he can just put the super function here instead of that because he can just take that method and overwrite it. So if somebody, so the threat scenario is somebody comes in, he manages to open a Python shell in your browser or in, in your web server somehow. And obviously all your code is in there. And then he can obviously override everything. So the security in the app doesn't really help. Because the only real threat scenario is A, you've got a bad programmer. Yes, this helps. But you sort of assume your code should be good. Or somebody has come into your web server and he's got access to your executable files. And then he can just overwrite this, delete it, whatnot. So you really Yes, yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this would be the right thing to write that into into the, the delete. Or you or what we do is we also override the filter and the all and the get. Exactly, and then you're, you're sort of secure that everything that builds on top won't, won't destroy anything. But anyway, I, at the end, I didn't find anything I thought was, was secure. Uh, the PostSQL permission stuff is really hard and really easy to get wrong. Uh, I didn't know anybody, I couldn't find anybody that really knew it. That was really weird. I tried to hire people and we couldn't because nobody really knew. Uh, and uh, we can't fix it in the code. So what can you do? Yeah, you need a layer in between. And I'd love your input on this because I've been coding this, basically. And um, I, I don't know if it really, I, I, I hope it makes sense. But uh, maybe you've got some ideas. So I'd love your feedback after in a few minutes. Um, so basically what I've done is I've written a, a server that identifies himself as PostSQL, that he verifies the login credentials with a real server. And then he takes some queries. And he parses these queries and just, so the queries Django creates through the OIM are really, really simple. I mean, most of them are, you know. So what I do is I, I learn queries uh, from my test cases because I've got tests that run and I know which test cases they run. And I also have like some user behavior scripts that I extract from live data. So I see how does a user react? What does the user submit? And um, I use this to basically train my, my security model. And then uh, for now, uh, I have to tag variables manually, but hopefully in the future, uh, the script will learn automatically what's a variable and what's not. And uh, so I write a regex which says this is how this looks like. And then as soon as I, and then I train it. I, I've got this data set, I train it, then I've got a big a regex tree at the end of the day basically. And as soon as something doesn't match this regex tree, I say, okay, I don't know this query, what am I gonna do? And so when we deploy this, We'll get a few notifications, we'll have it running on a shell, and the query will just stuck, stuck there, and I'll just do, yes, okay, this looks good, or well, this doesn't look good. And, uh, and then it will learn this, hopefully I'll add this query to the training set, and so forth. And so hopefully at some stage we'll have a complete regex with all the queries we will expect from the server. Um, so then uh, I want to, or what I do now is actually I assign a trust variable between zero and one, to each query. This is really crude. 
But ideally, you would say, OK, this is my logging database. Uh, queries that have a trust of 0 0.2, they can go on my logging, because I don't really care about that. But on my user database, I only want queries that have a trust variable of 1, which basically 100%. This is really trustworthy. It's specifically allowed in the regex. Uh, and it can also have handcrafted rules. So basically, this is like the standard rule that's disallowed, select star from users. And I'm like, no, this is not happening. And I forgot the semicolon here, by the way. Uh, but select star from users where username equal x, yeah, that, that sounds like something a normal app would run. So I say, yeah, this is OK. What I want to add in the future is that th I can then specify this is only allowed to return one record. Because then I could say, look, if it returns two records, something's wrong here. Uh, or you're not allowed, users is never, actually users is never allowed to return more than one record if you just do authentication on your app, right? So everything that returns more than one, one record, I'm like, no. But currently, I would just pipe the result through. Uh, don't tell me this already exists, please. <laughs> if you know of something, send me an email tomorrow morning or when I'm asleep <laughs> or tonight when I'm drunk. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'll get your feedback on that, what you think. I would love to pick your brains on this. Uh, then another threat, something, someone sees something you shouldn't. And Django is amazing in this respect. Uh, I really like Django. You just do decorators at login required. And we actually wrote our own decorator, check permission that the user has to be owner, and we do edit authors, and that's it. And this does all the checking for you. And this is so easy, so nice. Uh, from the experience, throw errors. Uh, don't prop, don't get something, and then if it's empty, just propagate it through and throw a 500 somebody at the end. Throw the error as early as possible. Uh, weird things happen with null values. Uh, the next threat, I have to hurry up. Um, someone can read your database. So uh, let's say. Uh, somebody hacks your machine, and as I said, the first thing he does is he does select star on users, right? So what you want to do is you want your database to be encrypted, right? You want the user to add some sort of key, the database encrypted. So there's this really nice encryption library, which I don't know how to pronounce, which is by Google. And what we did is we overwrote the dev to Python and get prep value. So basically, all the communication Django has with the database and as long as it's a text field and a char field, uh, we don't encrypt integers, uh, <laughs> is encrypted by the key of the project. And like this, if somebody manages to do a select star on our databases, uh, he'll at least just see garbage for the text fields or text data. Uh, in the future, we want to roll this out on images too. Uh, the problem with images is uh, CPU power that we don't have the CPU power to decrypt an image on the fly and serve it. We had it, and we needed these huge servers we couldn't afford, and it was just really, really hard to do properly and fast. But for the database, it works fairly, because text is fairly small, fairly condensed, uh, and it's fairly fast. Uh, we've got some performance overhead, obviously, uh, and you lose some queries you shouldn't be doing anyway, like like queries and stuff like that. But uh, Normally, these result in full table scans in most cases, so you shouldn't be doing them anyway. You should have an index. Uh, of course, you lose the indexing. Uh, I started writing an encrypted index, uh, but I haven't finished yet. Uh, so CPU power is needed for this, uh, but I think it's worth it because the actual overhead uh, we have, CPU is not what, what's limiting us on the machines. Um, and Django extensions has something like this. And a lot of influence came from Django extensions that, that we copied a lot. Uh, yeah? Yes. So this is on a field level. So, so what, we, what we write is models.encrypted text field, models.encrypted char field. And it say, takes exactly the same parameters. It inherits from those fields. But the only thing we do is when we serialize to the database, we encrypt it. And when we basically get the result from the database, we decrypt it. So obviously, you've still got your, your clean text in memory. Uh, I sort of looked at memory encryption and couldn't find anything good. And that was performant. OpenBSD has done a lot in that respect. 
But I sort of assume if somebody's hacked our memory, then yeah, we've got, we're, 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 yeah, we're effed anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, then I think I'm hearing more and more now is uh, the users don't trust the service anymore, especially with this whole NSA thing coming up, with this whole, yeah, the service is out to get us. And uh, a lot of services I see are like, oh yeah, yeah, we encrypt everything client side and, and uh, yeah, that we only upload en encrypted stuff to the server. And then sort of, uh, we had a very interesting discussion at the Berlin Django uh, Stammtisch about this. And, um, and then, they, so they trust the server in giving them the right JavaScript, but they don't trust the server in handling their data. So surely if the server is bad, we'll just inject some JavaScript or we'll just inject a bad key and then we could still decrypt it, right? So this is a discussion I find sort of followed up by quite people that haven't thought it through yet, if that makes sense. Uh, if, the, if the user doesn't trust you, then he shouldn't trust the JavaScript he's getting from you either, right? Because it sort of defines the whole logic. So uh, I agree, in, in encryption client side in JavaScript is really cool. Uh, if we would get this to everywhere, it would be amazing. Especially the load on the servers would go down. <laughs> uh, this is why would the user not trust you, but trust your JavaScript. So a way we're investigating right now is that we will have a plugin that comes from Mozilla or whatever, and that verifies the JavaScript that comes from us, and all the JavaScripts are open source. So even if we would inject some bad JavaScript, the plugin would alert. And this adds to security. If someone would hack our servers and inject bad JavaScript, also the plugin would come up and say, look, this is not true. And like this, we sort of hope to have like a transparent way of doing it. I don't know if we'll be doing this, yeah. Yes. Yes, so, so uh, basically encryption in JavaScript is really, really slow. So the first problem I ran into is true random numbers. I didn't find any good implementation in JavaScript of a random number generator. Everything I found was like, yeah, yeah, it's time. <laughs> Which isn't random. Uh, so, so the first thing, the API will hopefully, uh, they, they're talking about a true random number generator. Uh, and then the problem with JavaScript is that all the modern chips, they have these really good crypto chips. That's why uh, hard disk encryption doesn't cost us anything. That's why all these encryption stuff is really, really fast because they've got a special chip on their chips. And uh, what JavaScript does, if you have all these encryption libraries, it runs it on the main CPU. And that's really slow because the CPU is not made for encryption. So, a lot exactly. Yes. Uh, so the, the problem still stays, uh, yes, you can encrypt it, even through the new JavaScript API stuff, you can encrypt it really nicely on the client, but you're still pushing it to a service you don't trust. Uh, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, maybe some offline JavaScript features, yeah. Uh, I was thinking one possibility was uh, for you something that I still don't have the Okay. Yes. 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 I, I read about that too, but I don't know any browser that supports it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, so what we sort of, what's yeah? But I, I read about that, and that's a very good idea actually, to to do file. Uh, one problem I see with that approach is that uh, updates are going to be quite slow because I mean we roll out two three times a day, so we we have these very small and we're very fast. Uh, knowing DNS is going to be hard. Yeah, exactly. You need that. So, um, but uh, so we're just experimenting with this plugin. This is just sort of the direction we're going. Uh, yes. Not yet. Not yet. We're playing around with it. Yeah. So, so ideally the plugin, yeah, so the plugin, basically what the plugin does, it verifies the header. So what it does is it takes a whole head section and does a, an, a hash on it. But of course you can put scripts somewhere in the text, uh, but we haven't done that yet. <laughs> but yeah, so the idea is that if you have the JavaScript 
uh, open source, and everybody can sort of generate the hash in some way. He has a plugin where the hash is displayed. He can sort of trust it. Uh, there's no, I, I haven't found a really nice solution, actually. Uh, otherwise, Django is amazing. It's all there, cross-site scripting. You use it, uh, enable it, you use it. It's, it just does such a good job at it. <laughs> Uh, never use uh, the safe decorator, basically. You'll get in a whole world of pain. Uh, it's just so nice. I mean, coming from, from programming web servers in C and just seeing our SQL injection is dealt with, and you're like, this is amazing. Uh, even email header injection, uh, all this stuff is just done. And uh, uh, then, uh, again, a personal story. I've seen... <laughs> Threat detection working perfectly, but nobody responding to the email. And uh, actually, this happened a month ago. Uh, oh, yeah, it was his job. No, it was his job, and it was a circle. And so nobody did anything. And the server was hacked, and it was standing there for days till somebody sort of looked at the server and said, he's still hacked. And he's like, yeah, it was him and him and him. And so be sure that you notice when you're hacked, at least. Uh, there are some papers, some research done on this uh, by University of Oxford that say, uh, if you kn it's more important to notice when your server's been hacked and just destroy it than actually preventing hacking. Uh, I don't totally agree with that, but I, I sort of like the approach that you sort of monitor really hardcore your server, and if you notice anything weird with that server, you just kill it. But you just freeze it for, an for analysis later, but it's not in a production server anymore. So uh, I, I can't stress this enough, have a central log. I I've seen, uh, I'll let me finish and then, have a central log. Uh, I know people that have 30, 40 servers, huge servers that don't have a central log. Uh, emails are not enough. I get a few hundred emails every day. If that goes into spam, I will never read it. Uh, have error follow-ups. So uh, what we do now is all our error messages go to, a, to a basically a bug tracking or support tracking system. And so if uh, some monitoring service detects something, it creates a tracking cookie, a, a tracking task. And one of us has to follow it up because otherwise it's open, right? So one of us has to go there and say, okay, I've done this, I've solved it. Um, and we have notification propagation. So if somebody hasn't acted on a task in 24 hours, we email his boss, <laughs> which is incredibly effective. <laughs> uh, you had a question, yeah. Oh, come on. Yes. Yes. So the idea is that you pull up new servers, obviously, while you're doing it. And, but uh, I, yeah, I read the paper two, three years ago, and I was like, I, f I saw a lot of flaws in it too. Uh, and, and you've got like, you've got like, what happens if the notification is wrong, right? You just shoot off a user every time he tries to upload a picture of his family, and somehow it's a different color encoding, and you're like, no, I don't like this color encoding, and you, the session times out which is not user experience you want, right? And I find it very hard. So what they did, they froze the virtual machine, and they then analyzed it later. But uh, I quite like that we get an email or a ticket, and then we just go in and check right away what's happening. And we can sort of see if it's a real hack, uh, which hasn't happened so far, or if it's something we didn't expect and can act on it and stop more notifications coming in. Yeah, so uh, basically, Ask me stuff and check out DBook. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so we've got everything virtualized anyway. Uh, because we've we've got multi. Uh, I personally think Docker makes a lot worse because I know how programmers do sys stuff, and I wouldn't trust. Uh, okay, there are some programmers that can do it without question, but I've seen some of the fabric scripts I've seen in my time when programmers try to do deployment, and it's probably this whole DevOps thing, right? It's always sysadmins against programmers and. Uh, I quite like just deploying from a Git tree and doing the whole staging old school approach. 
Uh, Docker is very, very good if you have lots of developers with different machines that deploy rapidly, definitely. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, how does it contain security threats in the respect, it might contain it in the Docker, but it also does it in a virtual machine, right? So, yeah, uh, I've... But we, we do that in virtualization and... It's, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, it's process isolation, which we do with virtualization, but well, we do it actually with physical machines nowadays. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, process isolation, I mean, I, I'm very astonished that it hasn't come to the desktop yet, because uh, a few years ago, I had my Firefox in a virtual machine, uh, because I was so afraid of security holes in Firefox. Uh, but... Um, I don't know why, I mean, process isolation has been around for 30, 40 years, I mean, and it hasn't really happened yet. And, but I, I agree, yeah. I haven't played around with Docker too much to, to do it, but yeah, we do it with virtualization. That's basically what I can say, which is just a bigger layer, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have uh, we do it on the local machine. Uh, basically, we have a cron job that has a nifty Python script, and then we have Hadoop jobs that take all the log files in and do monitoring on that. But we do that two times a day. We have a big Hadoop job that kick, kicks in with all the log files. Uh, because uh, we have some historical analysis to, going on there, and uh, for example, what we also do is uh, we have user behaviors. Uh, so imagine a timeline, and uh, you have clicks or actions on this timeline. And uh, so what we do is user behavior changes over time. So a user will become more proficient as long as he, the longer he uses the software. But what, so what you can do is you can sort of see how advanced the user is. And then if he does something really weird at some stage, you can sort of see, okay, this is sort of what he should be doing at the beginning. And so it's his girlfriend using it mostly. <laughs> That's sort of the, the average case where we got quite nervous and there was just his girlfriend, kid or something using his account. Uh, but uh, so we do that in Hadoop. We do cl classical MapReduce. Uh, we're looking at Stratosphere uh, to do that with their stream processing, uh, which isn't ready yet. Uh, I haven't found a really good real-time stream processor yet in big data. Um, and we do really, really slim real-time logging on the machine. Like basically, just log file analysis when we stream it off to the master. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting question, and I hope, I hope nobody would ask that. <laughs> so the future is that we store the keys uh, on the client, and he gives us basically something to decrypt it. What we do now is we have a really locked down database, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so we still have all the keys in one central repository, uh, just because we haven't had the time yet to, to have a proper key distribution. And, and is someone using these like all users can use like all the keys? No, so select all users doesn't work now anyway. Oh, yeah, but but no, it's it's a total different system. Okay. It's a, it's a t so our key storage is is something I, I don't want to talk to too much in public, but uh, I know it's not 100% secure because ideally what you would want to do is have the password generate some sort of key that does a decryption. But I haven't found a really nice way that if somebody loses this password, or we have this sharing feature that many people can access and edit a document, and it becomes incredibly complex. Uh, if you want to do this key encryption like that. And uh, maybe I'm not good enough at math or something, but I haven't figured this one out yet. <laughs> to, so now for now, because time is limited, we just have a really secure key storage, which is handwritten, which uh, hopefully is, is secure than any data. <laughs> it's, it's a modified Kerberos LDAP thing, basically. Yeah. So we have uh, 16 shards. 
So roughly 20 machines, pro probably a little bit more, and we use SCP. <laughs> and then we do analysis on it. Uh, clearly, I haven't had the time yet. I, I know there are lots of solutions out there. I know there's. Uh, I, I know there's. I know there's a lot out there. I just hadn't had the time yet to do it. Uh, so, for, so for now, what we do is we do SCP, and then we uh, just have Moonin that reads those files, which works quite well because we just have an SS, uh, SCP tunnel that key is open, and we stream to the file. So you get all the advantages of SSH, it being encrypted, it being fairly fast. Uh, we have the key authentication and all that stuff, uh, and we just pipe. We just tree basically. And, uh, and SSH has been incredibly good, uh, uh, so, and it works. I mean, it, it was a hack and it works. And, and we detect when the SSH tunnel comes down, so we know when a machine is sort of having a problem. Uh, he was first, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So. Exactly. So, so uh, basically, just freeze it, right? We have virtualization, just freeze the machine and put it somewhere where it's safe, and then analyze it, uh, not being live on the network. Uh, yeah. Yes. No, he can't. He can't edit it. I mean, it's probably he could. He could modify the file pointer, and yeah, probably he could modify it if he. Now you all know, right? And the internet knows. <laughs> we have to change this tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, it's not perfect. I agree. It's uh, obviously I just hadn't had the time yet to optimize it. Uh, we're a very small team and <laughs> have luckily exponential growth, <laughs> which is horrible right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it will go to the honeypot, it's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, well, I mean, obviously you need one user to get in. And, yeah. So, okay, so no user that, uh, so what we have, we have a normal login user. Root is not allowed in via SSH. So we have the standard there. The, I don't actually know the password because on user creation, I just set a massively random password. But that user has sudo and then can get root and that's how we run the configuration management. But we have, yeah, you always need one user to get in. Uh, I, I wouldn't know a way. Uh, I mean, what I've been thinking about is using LDAP to basically have one central user that we sort of manage, uh, but I don't see the big advantage yet. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I mean, we have accounts. Uh, we have WW Data. We have PostgreSQL. But obviously, those users don't have a shell. They don't have SSH access. They don't have. So uh, we still have that one user that we can get into. But uh, only a few people have the certificate to go into, and. I, I, I hope that people don't do stupid things. It's a c cylinder. How do they call it? They've got the secure storage thing, haven't they? A silo or something. Salt has this really cool secure storage uh, container where you can put your ETC password in it and will distribute it yeah. in a secure way. Yeah. But I, uh, So actually, you can configure salt that it will actually phone out. Uh, so you would actually you could get rid of your user if you really wanted to <laughs> by getting salt to f uh, get the salt master and get its configuration file from the salt master uh, periodically. 
but I wouldn't, I don't know, I haven't dared to do that yet. <laughs> so again, physical access has failed, right? Because uh, just a few days ago, exactly that happened. I locked myself out of a machine, not for this project, for another project. And I just uh, went to the virtual machine, or to the console. I rebooted the machine, put single at the end of grub, and I was root. <laughs> it was that easy, and, right? So uh, that's probably something I, I should have added too. The dashboard of your virtual machines is probably the most important thing you've got. <laughs> if that password isn't that long, and, uh, because as soon as you can reboot the machine and you've got the dashboard, it's compromised, right? Uh, so yes, yes, that will come definitely. I mean, we've got that with email and all that already, uh, but uh, I've all I've got the app on my phone, and uh, I haven't gone that far to have the SSH stuff go that far. Yeah, that's what we've got. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so in the future we'll probably have that. So, so PAM, the, the PAM two-factor authentication rules have been around for years, and it's well tested. Uh, years back, I mean, this was 2007, uh, we used LDAP with two-factor authentication Kerberos, and it worked perfectly. I mean, you just have to buy these quite expensive RSI tokens, and uh, that were hacked by the NSA, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> which uh, We bought thousands of them, and everybody had to carry it around, and it was horrible uh, to, to maintain. And then the news came, NSA had hacked them, and we was like, ah. Oh. But um, yeah, so that worked really nice. So uh, getting two-factor authentication in Linux is edit editing five lines, I think, of code. Just add the PAM rule in the PAM stack, and, and it works. Yeah. Okay. The biggest problem is the synchronization of the seed in all servers. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's basically a server that's synchronized with the seeds of the yeah. tokens within servers. Yeah. Because uh, if you have a range, if you walk off that range, the other server won't bring back. Exactly, yeah. Uh, we just did it with ranges. So we didn't have a synchronized seed. Then, mm. then, uh, if, you, if you want to reset, you can use a uh, time synchronized token, but you have much more expensive. Exactly. So yes, I agree. Uh, probably the future, I think, is with phones. Like everybody's going to have an app on their phone, and it's going to phone in and phone out, and because my phone's online all the time. And, uh, but I haven't seen anything useful there with Linux. Maybe there is. Uh, questions or comments? Nobody commented on my genius idea of the self-learning SQL algorithm. This was like this is hours of my life. <laughs> oh, that was the main point. <laughs> uh, Cool, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll see you at the beer booth thing. <laughs> <laughs>